Lord, we just ask that you would give wisdom and, and speak to us through your word this evening. I'm thankful, Lord, for being able to be here and, sh- and spend some time in fellowship with one another. And, and uh, we just ask for your, your calm and your peace. And uh, just, Lord, give us, give us understanding of your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, make any sense to turn that up. All right, Isaiah chapter 5. All right. So this, especially this first part of Isaiah here, is talking a lot about uh, the judgment that would come on Israel for um, embracing the, the cultures around them rather than staying to his word and his instruction. Uh, Isaiah is kind of the the final warning. Um, if you know the story, though, of Israel, the, the warning's not heeded, and they end up going into uh, captivity into Babylon. And really, it'd probably be more proper to say Judah, but um, there are going to be some things in here again, like we saw last week. Uh, God doesn't just say, here's the sin, here's the judgment, and leave it at that. He always brings it around to, here's the redemption that comes after that. So hopefully his correcting, whether it's through a nation like Israel or our own personal life, the, the, that's kind of a cycle, is what I would say he uses with us, with here's the sin, here's the, here's the penalty for that, but here's your here's your redemption, right? Your forgiveness. Um, and even as those who are walking in, and particularly those who are walking with the Lord, here's how you come back here and, and come back into a time of blessing or 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 whatever with with God. Because even if uh, we don't have to have great wealth or position or responsibility or anything else like that to uh, to have a relationship with God, right? Um, and those things don't necessarily point to a good relationship with God. You know, we, we've all run into people or seen people or heard of people who uh, <laughs> were very wealthy and would say that God blessed them or very... I don't want to say wealthy. I hate to always just point at people with money. Um, but they don't, have a, they don't have a lot of cares, right? They don't have, the bills are all getting paid. The kids are growing up good. And we look at that and say, well, you know, that's, that's God, God's blessing in their life, and it may be, but they don't always do well, or it doesn't mean they never have any kind of catastrophe that challenges them in the way they think or or. Maybe it's not even just a challenge as much as it is it brings out of the heart and exposes what's actually in the heart so that it can be dealt with. And, you know, sometimes we, we can have that exposed and we're just between us and God because we don't act on what's in our heart. We're, we're wise and, we, and we, God exposes something to us first and then we deal with it with him and other times... We want to ignore it or justify it, and then he's going to deal with it maybe in a public way um, of some sort. But nonetheless, here we are with Israel. They've, they've not been doing well. They've not been walking with him. They've violated his laws. They've embraced the paganism around them and brought that into their, their religion and worship. And uh, so we're going to continue on with that. Uh, verse, five, or verse, five, verse 1 of chapter 5 says, Now let me sing... Uh, to my well-beloved, a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My beloved uh, has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. Uh, he built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, uh, but it brought forth a wild gra- or wild grapes. Right, so, <clears throat> this is through Isaiah, God making a, a, a poetic example. Right? So, probably your Bible, unless it, some don't do this, but 
this looks more like a psalm right now uh, in the way that it is. And because it is, I mean, he starts right off with, let me sing, a, or let me sing to my well-beloved uh, a song, right? So it's written like that. The, the language of it is that way. Um, and so we have somebody, it's a story, obviously, in the, in the song uh, of somebody who's created this vineyard. It's fruitful or it should be fruitful. It, there's no reason why it wouldn't be, right? The, the ground is, is uh, fertile, and he's, he's left his mark in there with a tower kind of... Uh, kind of we, we might say today we planted a flag, right? We, we've left our mark. This is, this is ours. And God has done that with Israel, and he, the expectation there is he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. So if, if they would follow the law, which... Uh, through Moses, he said in Deuteronomy, if you'll follow my law, if you'll do what I tell you to do, it'll be well with you. When you don't, you're going to go into captivity. So the, the initial warning before even going into the promised land is the same. And, and this is a lot, of, a lot of time where God was patient with Israel and they didn't come around. And Judah, now Judah would have some good kings, some bad kings, so they kind of had an up and down uh, deal in the south. But as a whole, the nation wasn't doing well. It wasn't responding, it wasn't following his law. <clears throat> and really, it had kind of gotten to a point where he had no relationship or, or very little relationship with him. Verse 3 says, and, and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I may that I have not done it? All right, so what else could I have done? What what could I have done differently? To me? you ever say that to your kids or or to anybody? Right? If you've run a business or managed anything, what what could I possibly have done differently to get you to understand what I wanted you to do? Right. This is what more could I, could have been done to my vineyard that I could, that I have not done in it? Why then, when I ex uh, expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, <clears throat> I will, uh, and it shall be uh, burned and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come upon... There shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord is, of hosts is the house of Israel. The men of Judah are the, his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Right, so, you know, the, the song kind of quits pulling punches in, right? It's not so poetic anymore. Let me just tell you straight. You're the vineyard. You know, you're the, you're the one. The men of Judah are, are, are supposed to be part of the vineyard, right? The, this whole, my people, my people, you were supposed to do good. You were supposed to be a light to the rest of the world of who I am and, and the righteousness of God. Right? And, and justice and what, what was good and just should be being done in Israel not, you know, uh, not the same wickedness as going on in the rest of the world where they're worshiping other gods. So there's a lot of idolatry uh, going on and, and that kind of thing. So he said, I look for justice, but had oppression. If you go through some of the minor prophets, you, you might see this more, but and maybe we'll see more as we go through Isaiah. But um, one of the charges from one of the other prophets, I want to say it was Amos, but I'm not sure. Um, was that they were making widows and orphans homeless. They weren't taking care of them. They were putting them out. They weren't, they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. So look for justice and got oppression and for righteousness and behold a cry for help. Right? So there's no righteousness. Now, this could also very easily speak of Jesus' time, right? With the Pharisees, it kind of fits them. Th this is why uh, probably after a few confrontations with Jesus, if he would address their questions or their accusations with, have you not heard it or have you not, have you not read 
because they were the ones who were supposed to have read this and kept it. The scribes came from them who, who wrote the scrolls and copied the scrolls in a very super religious way so that, <clears throat> and I say that to a, a, in a good way, that it was so meticulous that we have scrolls that are hundreds of years apart from each other and they're virtually the same. Um, so, you know, you have all of that. You should have been just, right? You, you should have treated people well. You should have been righteous, right? You should have been the ones showing the righteousness of God. And instead, they get, he gets a cry for help from the people that they're oppressing rather than that. So then, in Jew, in, again, back to Jesus' time, you have these guys who walk around with their robes, with their little bells, so it rings, so everybody knows they're coming, all the pomp and circumstance of saying, hey, look, I'm this religious elite guy, I'm a Pharisee, I'm part of the Sanhedrin, I'm part of the priesthood, whatever it was. And, and they knew what the justice of God would be, or should be, and they would know this prophecy as well, and yet they still treated people contrary to God's word. Right? They used the word, they used the religious ordinances and that kind of thing to oppress people and and then turn around and bring charge against Jesus like why does your master eat with sinners right why is he eating with the tax collectors why is he eating with you know the harlots why is he why is he around them why is he you know touching lepers and why is he doing all the things that you're not supposed to do in their book or things that would defile them um and so then there's, there's no righteousness in their heart. It's only religion, right? There's no relationship with God. And they're not being a good representative to the people of, of God. So verse 8 says, Woe to those who join house to house. They, are added, they add field to field uh, till, there, uh, till there is no place. Where they, uh, where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. In my hearing, the Lord of hosts said, Truly, many houses shall be desolate, great and, and beautiful ones, without inhabitants. For ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and an omer of seed shall yield one ephah. Now, I don't know exactly what the amounts are. Maybe some of you have a study Bible there that, that would have the amounts, but or what it would compare to us, but... Uh, a bath, maybe a tub of grapes out of uh, an acre of land, that's not a good return. Right? In, a, in a seed, you put, you put seed out for, for wheat or whatever for bread, and an ephah is not much from, a, from an acre of land. You should have much more than, than what they're getting. Um, and part of this is the way that they're treating the land. Right? They're working it to death, it sounds like, and they're working as much as they can and they, they run the houses together rather than spread out, rather than everybody owning their parcel of land or having their parcel of land. It all looks like one, one thing which they weren't supposed to do. Uh, verse 11 says, Woe to those who rise... Am I down to 11? Yep. Yeah, okay. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink, who continue until night till wine inflames them. The harp and strings and the strings, the tambourine and flute and wine are in their feasts, but they do not regard the work of the Lord nor consider the operation of his hands. So listen in the military, I knew some guys who got up in the morning and couldn't function until they had a beer. I mean, like some of us go for a cup of coffee, they went right to the alcohol right away to even get moving in the morning. That's how bad alcoholics were, and it did. It continued until late at night, and, and they were wrecking their lives. And you can see the physical toll that that takes on a body when somebody does something like that. But he's saying, woe to, woe to you who do that. You're, you're wrong. You're, right? This is just wrong. You're not thinking clearly. Uh, when when a, a verse in the Bible starts with woe, and then the activity afterward is is there. It's uh, it's a, there to get your attention, right? You don't want woe, to, woe attached to an activity of your life. <laughs> you know? 
So woe to this. It's not, you're not thinking correctly. Right? Uh, you, you have all the music. You have all the instruments. You have a celebration in the feast. But you don't think about the work of the Lord or what the Lord has done. It's not about that anymore. It's only about the party. Right? It's not about what God has done. It's not a real celebration of his activity in your life. Um, verse 13 says, Therefore my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men famished, are famished and their multitude uh, dried up with thirst. Therefore Sheol has enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure. Their glory and their ma- multitude uh, and their pomp and he who is jubilant shall descend into it. People shall be brought down, each man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God who is holy shall be hallowed uh, in righteousness. Then the lambs shall uh, feed in their pasture. And in the waste places of the of the fat ones, strangers shall eat. Right? So basically, you're gonna you're you're gonna go into a captivity. Your life, uh, we might say, your life is gonna be hell. Right? The the life of this of this nation is gonna be one of torment. You're gonna be slaves. You're gonna go into into captivity. You're not gonna be you're not gonna be honorable. It says they, they have no knowledge. It's like they've not been taught by those who should know. Uh, we could certainly look at the church, and again, while this is a charge against Israel specifically, you can look at the church and see the same. They don't know. There are many churches out there that don't teach the word of God. They have no idea what a real relationship with God is like. And those who are supposed to be honorable men aren't right? in their heart they're just they're they're famished uh, they're hungry the multitude dried up with thirst they're not feeding their flock right? they're not feeding their flock the word of God and I've heard more than one more than one very popular pastor if you want to call them that clips of them telling their congregations some of you are asking for more Bible study. Some of you want more word, verse by verse. You want a deeper study in the word. He said, but why would I do that so you could just get there, sit there and get fat? You're not going to go out and do anything with it. If I put all that work and effort into it and you don't go out and do anything, then what good is it? Well, dude, that's still a charge on you. right? You're going to answer to God for that. They're going to answer to God with what they do with the truth. You know, you kind of fall back into that whole instruction to Ezekiel. You tell them what I've told you to tell them. And if they resist or they reject it, that's not on you. That's on them. But if you don't tell them what I tell you to tell them, right? if you don't tell them my words, then their blood is on your head. You know. But we don't want to, again, we don't want to be in the Old Testament anymore, right? Because we're all New Testament churches. Well, it's the same thing. They're redued. <laughs> Jude goes after the false teachers and those who would mislead and, and deny God and deny his power to the people or, or whatever, and he hammers them. Uh, I think if I remember right, it starts off in the, in the beginning of that one chapter book, we would call it, or one chapter letter. I, I intended to write to you about our common salvation, but then the, I think it was like the Spirit told me, this is... We need to contend for the faith, right? And, and went about identifying, not by name, I don't think there, but giving great examples of what it means to mislead people. So, you know, if, if a congregation is hungry and thirsty and not getting what they, what they need, it's no wonder really that they don't follow the Lord as they should. But that goes on those who are the leaders of that of the that congregation. Um, <clears throat> anyways, you, you can also only give people the the food, and if they eat it, they eat it. If they don't, 
I've, I've seen that as well. Mm-hmm. I see, in a practical way, I see that played out with a, my goat that is a very picky eater. I mean, people talk about goats will eat anything and will eat tin cans and whatever else. And she will stick her nose through the grass just to find what she wants, and that's it. You know, the other goat that, that we had, uh, he, he would start with his favorite, but by the time it was all done, he'd had it all, the whole thing bowed right down. But not this one, man. She sticks her head in there and finds what she wants, and, and at times you're like, you're going to starve yourself for only what you want. So it, it does play into both sides of this, but um, you know, this is there, therefore Sheol, or this place of darkness or judgment, has enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure. You know, we, we talk sometimes when we see in Revelation uh, the different crowds or throngs of people in heaven, the 10,000 times 10,000s. And we say, well, that just basically means an innumerable number, right? We don't know how many. But when we know that that's the few, the few are so many we can't number them, but they're far fewer than those who have rejected God and are going to end up in the eternal judgment. And it's kind of alluded to there when Sheol's enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure. It's a place bigger than we can and bigger than we want to think. And, and everything, it's kind of Isaiah's way of saying everything's going to burn. It's all going to burn. Their glory uh, and their multitude and their pomp, everything they've stored up, everything that makes them look good, all of their recognition, all the stuff that they've gained in life uh, is all going to be, it's all going to burn. It's all going to descend down into there. People shall be brought down. Each man shall be humbled. And the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. So think about that. I've already brought up the false teachers and those who lead people astray, but every individual will be humbled before God. Every individual is going to give an answer for what we did, right? We don't get to say, well, you know, I sat in a congregation that listened to a bad pastor, so I'm, I'm with them. Yeah, you are. <laughs> but but it's, why did you stay there? Why didn't you seek me harder? Why didn't, you, why didn't you open your Bible and hold them to account for what they said? You know, that's, that's what you, uh, you have to do. So, so there is the, the congregation or the, the, the nation here in this, in this uh, idea of Israel but even in that, it's made up of individuals that will answer to God. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. And God who, who is holy shall be hallowed in righteousness. We often talk about God being a loving God. Good and gracious and merciful and kind. And for sure, those are the attributes of God that we want to exemplify before everybody. But we forget that God is also holy and righteous. And that demands an account of our wickedness. Why? Right? We're probably all going to hear that. Why? Or what? What did you do with what I gave you? Not why didn't you have more. What did you do with what, what I gave you? Did you do anything? Did you invest in the kingdom at all? Right? You have the, the parable Jesus tells about the, the servants. He gives ten I think it's 10 minus the one and five to another and one to another. And the, the two with the most invest their money and have more money when the master comes back and, and have a return for him. And the, <clears throat> the one who had one tried to justify it by saying, I know you're a prudent man. I know you, 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 know, you like to not waste your, your money. So I buried it. I didn't do anything with it. But here it is back. And what do you call it? A wicked, evil servant. And throw him out. Because you didn't do anything with it. It's been sitting in your lap all this time. You didn't do anything with it. And, and you know, and maybe this is only, maybe this is only our culture. Maybe it is human nature. But <laughs> So God is holy and righteous. And he's going to be worshipped. And, and, and uh, you know, whether we like that or not, doesn't matter. The reality of it is, is he's God and he's perfect. So as, 
He's holy, but his righteousness is also perfect. Uh, Then the lamb shall feed in the pasture. And in the waste places of, of the fat of one And in the waste places of, of the fat ones, strangers shall eat. So even though Israel is going to be desolate sometime after Isaiah, and we can look at a couple of different times. While they're in captivity in Babylon, it wasn't a great place. Uh, between the cross and until, what, 47, 46, 46, 47. 47, that it was pretty desolate. Um, can't remember who, uh, I want to say it was Hemingway, but I'm not sure. Huh? Mark Twain. Yeah, it wrote about how bad it was. That nobody would want to live there. It was just rocks and dirt, basically. And, and uh, you know, but now we look at it, and the prophecies of it becoming this basically flower blooming in the desert and what they're able to do with that. I mean, their irrigation is down to a plant. I heard Netanyahu talking about this some years ago. Their irrigation systems can know when to water one plant in the whole field. It's not, they don't have to water the whole field to get to that one plant. They, they can pinpoint it to the plant. That's pretty amazing. And to be a huge exporter of fruits and vegetables and flowers, like the, one of the biggest in the world, certainly one of the biggest in the Middle East. Weren't they taking soil that wasn't even, uh, had the natural salt and minerals, like it wasn't even durable. They were able to wash the soil. Yeah, and put it back. And do some nice things yeah. that could not grow before it grew. Yeah, they mm-hmm. make salt water, fresh water. They, they, and then... They're not just keeping that all to themselves. You know, they're going to third world countries and showing them how to run this stuff and, and setting them up to grow their own, you know, plants and stuff. Eight-foot tomato plants that are producing tomatoes. You, usually, if you have an eight-foot tomato plant, it's because you put too much nitrogen on it and it won't produce anything but leaves. So they're, they're running them up, and, and uh, <clears throat> it's amazing what they've been able to do in a place that used to be desolate, but there's that that uh, charge that it would basically be desolate, but at one time, at some point in time, it was going to have, you know, animals back on it, flocks back on it that would be able to be eaten. But here it said that... Lost it? There we go. I don't know. In the waste places uh, of the fat ones, strangers would eat it. And there were still people in the Middle East, whether you're talking about... Isaiah's time, or the the captivity time, the Babylonian time, or whether you're talking about uh, after the well, all these years, it used to be a Palestinian was both a Jew and an Arab, right? Jews and they were all called Palestinians until uh, Israel was given the land back, and the David Ben Gurion that basically said Israel is back, and and they became known as the Israelites again. That's what or the Jews. <clears throat> but it used to be a Palestinian was anybody who lived there. But it, so it wasn't until they got Jerusalem back? 67? So it was 48, they were, became a nation in 67, they got Jerusalem back? I always get the 7 and the 8 mixed up, which one it is, but... Um, anyways... Yeah, I mean, you even you even still have maps that won't say Israel over the place. In fact, chances are your Bible map says Palestine on it in the back of your Bible. David Hawking said, if that's the case, you need to scratch that out and put Israel on there. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Really. Yeah, in the commentary. In the commentary. The commentary in her. Evolution 
Not an option. So, verse 18 says, Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as if uh, with a cart rope. Let that say, that say oh, let me try this again. Woe to those who draw iniquity uh, with cords of vanity and, and sin as if with a cart rope that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. And let the, uh, the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come that we may know it. In other words, I'm not going to believe it till I see it. Right? There are many religious Jews that, that don't believe in Jehovah or Yahweh. There are those who still keep Passover because it's who they are. It identifies them, but they don't believe. Their, their culture is not a lot different than America's culture. They have a high abortion rate. They, all, all of it, everything that we do. They have their pride parades and everything else, just like we do. They do all that stuff. And, and many of them say, you know, basically, I'm, I, unless you can show me, and you listen to some of the atheists today, Right, so an atheist isn't just somebody who doesn't believe anymore. An atheist is one who is against the belief of God. Right? They're, they are outspoken, militant about it. And if you ask them, I think I brought this up on Sunday again too, if you ask them if God showed himself, could prove that he was God, would you worship him then? And they say no. Now I say, the Bible says, on the day that you see him face to face and he shows himself and you know he's God, you're going to bow and you're going to confess. You're not going to have any choice. Uh, and then you go off to your judgment after that. But, but anyways, woe to those. Woe to those who will say, I don't believe. I'm not going to believe unless you show me. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Right? So you don't even know, or you at least act like you don't know what's right and wrong. And basically, it's a culture that wants to, to uh, mess up the identification of everything so much, mishmash everything so you can't tell anything apart. Right? You, and we again, we see it with the whole transgender thing. That's really the design of all that. It's the... the personal pronouns uh, that's a ridiculous attack you would think but that is the design not just to confuse but to take away identification to take away knowing what's right and what's wrong the problem is if you read Romans chapter 1 we all know what's right we all know what's wrong and we're all going to answer for it so there's another woe if you call evil good and good evil Look out. <laughs> Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. You think you know a thing? You probably don't. <laughs> Again, in Romans it says they were, talks about those who thought they were wise but became fools. They think themselves to be wise. Um, and, and part of the ridiculousness of that Self-declared wisdom might be even what you were just talking about, that theistic evolution that says that, yep, God and evolution exist, and we have to make it that way because, well, science has proven that evolution is true. Science hasn't proven, not even close, that evolution is true. Not even close. So it doesn't belong anywhere in the creation story um, or creation account. Uh, trying to stay on that. Ken Ham beat that into us in that, at, that, at that conference this last fall. They're not stories. They're accounts. <laughs> okay, all right, we got it. Um, anyways, woe to mighty men at drinking wine. Woe to, mighty, uh, woe, to valiant, woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink. Uh, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from, a right, from the righteous man. Right, so, you know, I mean, this is all pretty self-explanatory, right? Doesn't take a lot. Woe to the men, to men mighty at drinking wine. 
that's your strength is that you can put down a lot. I mean, this is all very familiar to me. <laughs> all right? Uh, I bowl better if I drink. I drive better if I drink. I golf better if I drink. All that stuff. And they all, they all thought they were good. Better if they... Come on. Stay with me. Um, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from a righteous man. Right? So you're going to... You're willing to perpetuate a lie uh, in order for one person to have favor who doesn't doesn't uh, who who shouldn't have it and take away the righteousness or the righteous uh, uh, or I'm sorry the justice from the from a right man. So bribery basically within politics within the court systems. Uh, so that things were being found. And now their judges would be sitting at city gates and you would bring your complaints or whatever to them. So, you know, if one guy slips you a little extra money or whatever and you hear the case according to what he wants um, and get your bribe, get your payoff. Uh, 24, therefore, as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root will be as rottenness, and their blossom uh, will ascend like dust, because they have rejected the law of the Lord, uh, law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. That will always get you in trouble. Doesn't matter if you're Israel, doesn't matter if you're in the church, <laughs> or you think you are. When you have set yourself against God, when you've justified your, your wicked actions, uh, this is your outcome. This is what you have. You're going to be devoured like stubbles, devoured by fire. Um, if you've ever <clears throat> burned leaves and your grass is dry, you watch that, watch that fire start taking off <laughs> farther than it was supposed to. Get you a little nervous, especially when you have a big old barn in your backyard and you decide you want to burn off a little bit and it starts going and the wind picks up and you're like, oh, <laughs> you don't have a hose that reaches that fire. Speaking from experience. Um, it was it was a little unnerving for a minute uh, to have to smack down a fire that was getting away from me. Um, and really, so that's maybe a good example. We have controlled fires. We have controlled burns. Right? And this is talking like maybe you think you get to control your burn, but it's going to be gone, and it's all going to be gone. There won't be anything left. Your root will be like rottenness. You ever pulled up a plant that on the top looked like it was still green, should be bearing something, flowers, fruit, something, and you, you just grab it a little bit and it just pops off like the root falls out and you find out that it was root rot and there was nothing in it, nothing good in it, nothing to feed the rest of the plant. It's the same as despising or rejecting the law of the Lord of hosts, the word of God. They despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. Verse 25 says, Therefore the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. He has stretched out his hand against them and stricken them, and the hills trembled. Their carcasses were, uh, were as refuse uh, in the midst of the streets. For all his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. <coughs> So in judgment, there's still God reaching out and saying, please open your eyes, right? Please hear me. Still stretching out his hand. Uh, you could say we see that even in the picture of the tribulation time when you have some of the, the plagues that have happened, the, the seals and the, the bowls, and I'm not sure where exactly anymore this happens, but... You would then have an angel that flies through the air proclaiming the gospel. You still have the 144,000 on the earth proclaiming the gospel. It's still there. And even in the midst of that, so God is still reaching out in his judgment for those who will listen and those who will, who will turn to him, even though his anger is not turned away. And again, we see that in those who are believers in that time that are martyred for their faith. And it's a huge number of people that will come to faith even during the tribulation time. Verse 
Verse 26 says, He will lift up a, uh, a banner to the nations from afar and will, will whistle to them from the end of the earth. Surely they shall come with speedy, speed swiftly. No one will be weary or stumble among them. No one will, will slumber or sleep. No one, or nor will the, the belt, of, belt on their loins be loosed, nor the strap of their sandals broken, whose arrows are sharp, and all their bows bent, their, their horses' hooves will, uh, will seem like flint, uh, and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring will be like a lion. They will roar like young lions. Yes, they will roar and lay hold of the prey. They will cast it away safely, and no one will deliver in that, in that day. They will roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one looks to the land, behold, darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened by the clouds. He'll lift up a banner to the nations from afar. Now, I think this is talking about uh, Babylon coming. And in the way that they would come, like nothing's going to stop them. They're not going to trip because the sandal strap broke. They're not going to, it'll be like they, they're just going to be relentless. And we know that they were relentless. Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Jerusalem three times. And each time he would take more captives back. But they were relentless on, on Israel. And eventually they, they just took them. Right? It was no more setting up a puppet government. They tried that and then they would rebel. And so he finally was just like, poof, done. And, and this, is, this is it. Uh, they carried everything away. They carried away the utensils of the temple. We know that because um, Belteshazzar, right, Daniel's name was changed to Belshazzar or Belteshazzar? Belshazzar. All right, I get the two names mixed up if I'm not reading it. Um, but they, yeah, they are pretty close. But anyways, what does he do when he has a party and he's, and he's drinking and everybody's drunk and he sends for those utensils from the temple that his grandfather had taken and brings them into the party and begins to defile those by being a part of their pagan party. And at the same time, you, then you have the handwriting on the wall, right? Many, many tekel you farsen. You've been found in the balances. You've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. His judgment in that very night, the Persians come in and overthrow Babylon. And uh, so to, to defile God, um, anyways, these things are going to be carried away. Israel's carried away. Um, the northern tribes either were being or had already been carried away by Isaiah's time. Uh, by the Assyrians, and now the Judah and and Benjamin to the south are are facing the same thing. So the the land of Judah, which is inhabited by Judah and Benjamin, and and Jerusalem, they're they're waiting for their judgment to come. But they're going to be carried away. There's not going to be anything they can do about it, and they're just going to be overwhelming. Like they'll be able to darken the the sun, probably the. Speaking of the number of them that are coming, they may have seen swarms of locusts that would give them the idea of, of a swarm of locusts that would come up and darken the sun like a cloud. Um, maybe that's the picture that it paints for them here where you know, the noise of them coming is going to be great. Um, if, you, if you ever hear, if you could ever hear, and probably even greater in that time, the sound of thousands and thousands of, of men. You can't imagine what it would be like to hear them banging their swords and banging their shields and, and yelling at the top of their lungs. How intimidating that noise would be when you don't have that anymore. You Remember in, in chapter 4, their mighty men are gone. Or three or four. Their mighty men are gone. Their valiant men, their warriors are gone. There's nobody to defend them but God and they won't reach out to him. And so here you have you have the overwhelming of the nation in, in Isaiah saying, this is coming for you. This is going to happen. 
in the same way, you guys, we have our own message to deliver to the world. The kingdom of heaven is near. It's the same message that he gave the 12 and the 72 when he sent them out. You go from town to town, you tell them. That's, that's the main part of your message. The kingdom of heaven is near you. Right? And, and even for us, the good news is the kingdom of heaven is here. You can be forgiven of your sin. You can become part of that kingdom. Or judgment is coming. Right? And, and again, when somebody is complaining, well, if your God is all powerful and wonderful and great, why has he put up with evil? Uh, he won't for very long. Right? He won't forever. Sooner or later, his judgment is coming. His righteous judgment is coming. Well, they're not okay with that either because they know what that means. Right? They, they want just deliverance from what they believe is other people's evil so that their life can be what they want it to be. There is no idea to submit to God as their Lord. Right? They don't like that message. They don't like the message of judgment is coming. You know, in, in Second Peter, we have our own version of it's all going to burn. It was a loud noise and fervent heat. Everything passes away. And yet, at the end of Revelation, and yet they still can't find hope in this. You have, again, the new heavens, the new earth, all the whole new creation, living with Jesus forever. And the new heavens, new earth, new, you know, to hear him teach. It'll be amazing. But they don't find any hope in that. They would rather not only themselves go to their death not believing, but they would rather that everybody go with them. And, and they fooled themselves into thinking that it's just nothing. Right? There is no, no eternity after this. There's no life after this. Well, the Bible tells us that everybody is going to be raised from the dead. Some to everlasting life, some to eternal judgment. They don't like that. I don't particularly like it. I like the eternal life part. But you have a choice, right? And it's the same choice that Moses gave Israel before they went into the land. Basically, see, I've laid before you life and death. Choose life. And God has done the same thing with all of us. I've set in front of you the way to life, eternal life. I've set in front of you the way to destruction. Narrow is the way and narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. Wide is the way that leads to, the, to destruction. You know, there's your choice. Choose life. I feel like God's screaming that more and more. Choose life. Right? Don't choose death. Don't choose je- death in your actions. Don't choose death in your, in your living. Don't choose death in your dying. That maybe sounds kind of funny, but, but don't. Choose life in all of it. Knowing that our hope is not in this life. Our hope is in the Lord. Our hope is in the life to come. That is, that is our destination. Right? That's where we're going. We're not going to live here forever. That's already been determined. But there is a place we'll live forever. And he, he promised in John chapter 14, he's preparing that place for us. That where he is, we will also be. Right? Let's stop here and let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, this reassurance. And I know it's been a lot of talk about judgment and rejection of your word, but Lord, for us, it should be a reassurance that because we've embraced your word, your hand still reaches out. Even in the announcement, in the proclamation of the judgment to come, your hand of mercy and grace is still reached out for those who will take it, those who will believe. And so, Lord, thank you that you put your hand out to us. And, Lord, even thank you that we heard your voice and that you gave us the gift of eternal life with you. Lord, be with those who we know personally, especially personally, Lord, family members, friends who don't know you, who have been rejecting you, Lord, I pray that you would soften their hearts, that you would give us wisdom to be able to speak your word and your truth to them, that we would live it out in front of them.
Lord, that we would see many come to, to faith before we hear the trumpet blow. Lord, thank you for giving us something to do and not just waiting around for you. We love you and we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.